Change communications. What are they? And how do we make them really, really effective? Communications is one of the pain points I hear about most from change sponsors. And as a change manager or leader, this is an area where you can really come in and excel and make an incredible difference to the team that you're supporting and working with. So in this episode, I'm going to give you my quick breakdown and guide to how I design and build change communications for successful projects. I'm Natalia Loback, and this is the Change Course Podcast. I've spent my career leading complex change and transformation in organizations. And over my career, I've discovered what makes complex transformational change stick. Connected change is all about leading successful change within the context of the organization. And here at the Change Course Podcast, we're all about making change sustainable. So listen in, drop us a like, a comment, and let us know how we can help you connect and change. Okay, this episode is happening because this has been the biggest pain point that I've heard over the last few weeks from change sponsors. I've spent the last couple of weeks meeting with some really incredible organizations about change that they are either implementing or planning to implement. And the biggest thing that I hear about from these sponsors, the biggest thing that they are afraid of is other than resistance, communications. How on earth are we going to be able to build and implement? They're asking me, how are we going to be able to design and implement an effective change communication strategy? And in fact, because they know that communications internally in the organization is not strong enough to handle this, they are looking to hire a change manager or a change practitioner in order to be able to support this. There are two key things that I'm hearing that change sponsors need. The first is support for their communications. And the second is a really clear understanding of what good organizational change communications look like and the ability to design and implement that for them. Okay, so the first, how do we support our sponsors in really effective change communications? This is where, as an operations leader, I'm often working with change sponsors that are like really, really, really good in the area that they work in. They might be a manufacturing leader. They might be a science and innovation leader. Operationally, they know how to manage and lead a team in their spe- their specific area of expertise in their domain. But when it comes to change, this pushes at the comfort zone. And because we're seeing change happening in various parts of the organization, you're no longer seeing human resources being where the change person sits and human resources is responsible for the communications in the organization. No, 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 not so anymore. Your change sponsors and change leaders are diverse. They come from various different areas of the organization and communications might not be part of their strength. It might not be a skill that they lean on frequently, probably because they don't have to in the role that they have. Certainly the most effective executives that I've come across do have this strength in relationship building and effective communication. But sometimes change is that thing that pushes them out of the comfort zone. Even if they are very effective communicators for 
a bunch of other things or for the various other functions that they need to do, change communications are different. They are more difficult. They are more specific and need to be handled with finesse. So what I often say and what I'm going to share with you as a really important success tactic for you as a change manager coming into an organization or a role or a project is figure out how to support your sponsor effectively. I use something called the sponsor playbook. Um, That is part of Connected Change. It's also part of the work that I do. And this is where I help the sponsors understand what their role is and what they need to be communicating and how they need to communicate. I work with them to identify the various channels and conduits in the organization that exist for them to communicate and where they typically share messages with the organization and what that looks like. So some of this is identifying the current audiences that they have. Another part of it is identifying what additional forums and what additional audiences they need to reach as part of the change. And I set them off to work on that. I set them off to go and make sure that they are getting into those rooms. They're getting in front of those audiences. Okay, and I'm using rooms and audiences metaphorically because we all know that communications are multifaceted in organizations now, right? They're really different. And, you know, there's more ways to communicate with people than standing up in front of a static group of people in a room and speaking. That doesn't happen as often anymore. But I'm using it metaphorically in this idea that you need to find your audience in the place where they are. You need to reach your audience in a way that they're used to being reached. So how do we work together to identify that and figure out when and where you need to be reaching and interacting with these various audiences goes back to what I talked about last week with stakeholders. Who are the most important stakeholders that you need to be communicating to? Where are they? Which groups or forums do they inhabit? And how can you reach them effectively? The next thing I talk about is the key messages and what my sponsors need to be talking about at various stages of the change and how to address questions like, what is this actually going to look like for me when you don't necessarily have the answers? And you're going to get questions. The sponsors are going to get questions that they can't answer. So the key is identifying what some of those might be, and they're often kind of similar, identifying what they might be and figuring out how you're going to respond to it ahead of time and focusing on the core values of the change, collaboration, inclusion. So when you answer those questions, it's not, I'm going to take this away and go find an answer and bring it back to you. No, 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 no. It's about, I hadn't thought about that, or thank you for raising that. We want to seek to involve and include people in this change And what you've highlighted is a very interesting point. We need to consider that. Let's find a way to work together. How can we do this? It's more about having conversations than one way question and answer and feeling like you're being tested at some kind of, you know, test or dissertation. You need to prove your knowledge. That's not what's happening. So it's about really defining what that sponsorship role is and how to respond to questions you can't answer with the spirit of the change that you're looking to inhabit. What is that culture around change that you're trying to create? And how do you respond to questions you can't answer by drawing on those values? Then we look at, at each stage of the change, what are the key messages that they can deliver and what are we saying? Now, obviously, these messages... You may not have everything baked right at the beginning, but you certainly can work through the first couple milestones and what needs to be said and really helping your sponsor understand what the key points are that they need to hit. Most executives have really good communication skills or they should have a good foundation in that and they'll be able to put their own words around the messages that you're looking for them to deliver. And that really helps 
that message land, it will help them also come across as more trustworthy and more authentic because they are talking about the change in the context that makes sense for the organization, for their people, and they're using their own words, words that people have been used to hearing, a tone that people are familiar with. So it doesn't come across as something completely new and different. It is authentic. That's key. So you're not a script writer as a change practitioner. You're not writing a script for somebody. And if somebody asks you for one, say no. What you need to be helping them with are the key messages. What are the key points they need to be addressing? So as you go through that sponsor support plan, what you're going to end up with is something that looks a little bit like a project plan. Uh, Because what you're going to identify are the key forums, how those line up with the milestones, and what are those key messages and when are they being delivered and how. So you're getting to the what am I saying, when am I saying it, how am I saying it, and what does that look like for me as a sponsor. So it essentially turns into putting together a schedule and working potentially with the sponsor themselves or with any kind of support personnel they might have to put that together and help support that. In my role, I sometimes create communication materials, so presentations um, or just off the cuff key messages that might be delivered in some kind of formal or informal interaction. I also help sponsors create videos. And while I do do some script writing for videos, I do help my sponsor with writing those. We do it together so that it does sound authentic. Some people get very camera shy. And so having the words in front of you can be easier in some ways, but I don't write for them. We do it together. Anyway, I digress. But there are various ways that you can set your sponsor up for success by helping them to be authentic and genuine in their communications. Okay, the second piece, the organizational communications part. In many of the changes I've implemented, I have not had the support of an organizational communications office or person or function. Some of them I have, and we've been able to lean on that, but in other places we have not. And sometimes this is because the change that you are implementing may not affect the entire organization. There may be one or two specific places where that communication organization wide may be appropriate, but there are many more communications that happen as a part of your change initiative that you wouldn't necessarily funnel through an organizational communications function. So you might get some support, um, but you may not. And I've done both. I've had both in, you know, various different changes. So the key thing about organizational communications is you need to break them down into two really key parts. The first one is just the tactics stuff. So the tactics is like what you put on a birthday invitation. When's it happening? Who's going to be there? What's the date and time I need to be aware of? Where is the training? Who is leading it? What time do I have to show up? When do I sign up? Where do I need to be? What do I need to do? Tactics, details, that kind of stuff. So tactical communications are fairly simple. Those I usually schedule, like I look at my plan and schedule and I mark those in at the key milestones. What are the tactics we're communicating at these various points and what's important about them? And at the same time, you're also looking at that communications planning template and you're identifying the stakeholders who need to see it and you're identifying the various channels by which you're going to deliver that communication. Now, there are a bunch of effective ways to do that. You want to be looking at um, how your organization is structured, what existing forums and channels exist, i.e. web page, things like uh, organizational uh, chats, team sites, Where is other information shared? What does that look like? So that's another whole piece you need to figure out, but that's around the tactics of the scheduling and execution plan. Uh, Check out the 
one of the previous episodes that I talked about this and I'll link it in the show notes. Um, but we really get deep into what that tactic plan looks like. And we also have a resource uh, shared with our newsletter subscribers that goes over this in detail. So if you're not a subscriber, I suggest you visit connectedchange.com backslash newsletter and sign up because before we transition all of the resources into our membership site, we will be giving subscribers one last chance to um, download and take every you know anything that they needed from previous newsletters. And so we will be running the communications template again. So if you don't want to miss it, sign up for the newsletter now so that when I reissue it um, in one of our future issues of the newsletter, you will get it. So I digress. If you already picked it up, good. Um, Take a look at it and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. For those of you who haven't, sign up for the newsletter and you'll get it next time. So the tactics and the channels and the schedule and all of that stuff that you need to figure out how you're going to deliver that. Then what you're also looking at are your storytelling communications. Why is this change important? How does this link with the objectives of the organization? What is the story we're telling? How does this connect with the history of the organization? What has been the experience of your peers with implementing this change? What are your peers excited about? How do we talk about user experiences or personal experiences after the change has happened to build momentum for adoption and really get us over that tipping point? These storytelling communications are where you as the change manager really get to shine. This storytelling communication component is part of every one of your sponsor's key messages that might happen. It's part of some of those potentially part of some of the tactical communications. And it's also a key way that you will build momentum and excitement and adoption with your key most important stakeholders and importantly with your change network. Storytelling is incredibly powerful. It's how we as humans transmit messages and understanding and commonality and create incredible emotion around something that is very tactical and unemotional, to be honest, and changes an emotional experience. And so storytelling taps into that. And it's a really important part of it. If you want to learn more about the power of storytelling, I'm going to link you to three interviews that I did um, with a colleague of mine where she gets into the power of story and just how incredible a tool it can be. So I'll link those in the show notes as well. Those are not to be missed. Highly recommend you take a look at them if you want to learn more about how we actually use and apply story in the context of change. And she's a real expert. So it's a really great um, video interview. I suggest you watch it. I absolutely loved it. It was one of my favorite episodes to do. So the storytelling communications have very different conduits or outlets in the organization. And this is where you can get into some really creative and cool stuff. So when I've implemented communications um, and story-based communications, I'll do this in a variety of means. So I'll work with the sponsor to implement that. I'll work with our change network to bridge some of that storytelling with the people they're working with. I will use stories of impact with super users or trainers to help them transmit excitement to the teams that they're working with and teams they're training. And we pepper story into some of these tactical interactions because it helps people connect with the content. Story is such a powerful tool. The other way that I use it is through video. I do a lot of video communication and video is one of the most versatile and exciting ways 
to develop and deliver change communications. It helps people connect with the various change leaders that you're working with. It can democratize the change because you can feature lots of different people. And the stories that you tell on video, and especially through things like short term, short form video, are really exciting and powerful. They grab people's attention. They help people look at things differently and experience things differently. So as I've mentioned, um, you've got your three different, your two main categories and three different things you're looking at. So sponsor support, what does that look like? Look like? How are you building that up and ensuring your sponsor is supported? And then the second is your organizational communications broken down into two categories. The first being tactical. So what, where, why, when, how, who, that kind of stuff, birthday invitation, just think about it that way. And then the second piece being storytelling. As I wrap this up, I just wanted to touch on one final, really incredible storytelling communication that I used. Um, This tactic is something that was unique to this organization, but I've often sought opportunity to use it again. So in, um, I spoke previously about the restructuring that I did at a infrastructure services organization and the history of this organization and connecting the change through story was an incredibly powerful way to change how people thought about the change. Post-implementation, the organization was going through a really hard time. People felt like they'd been blindsided by the change It had been very difficult. The leaders felt like they were at odds with what they wanted to see happen and what they needed to do versus how the organization was reacting and responding to them. And so I pulled the leadership into a session to talk about the story of the change. And I said, we've got a really negative reception and perception of this change right now. And we need to change how people are viewing this. We are going to use story to do that. And so what I did was through facilitation with the senior team, we developed an origin story for the organization about how things had been before the change happened, where the organization came from, how it was growing, the excitement, the contribution of the people. And then we said, how do we then rewrite this origin story to align with where the organization is going to align with the change and the objectives of this change. How can we talk about the future and link it to the past by showing a pathway that didn't previously exist before? And so we rewrote the origin story of the organization And the leadership started talking about this origin story in every interaction that they had. This was one of the key things that started to change the way the organization was viewing what had happened during this very disruptive and massive change that they experienced. And so origin story and using story can be an incredibly powerful tool as part of your communications toolkit and approach. I hope you find this helpful. I did write an article on this experience um, around origin story. So I'll share that in the show notes. You can check it out for more detail about how you can actually craft a really exciting origin story that links the past with the change and then with the vision of the future And how impactful that storytelling can be for the organization. So check out the show notes to get that additional resource. And don't forget to sign up for the newsletter so that you can get your communications planning template for free. Thank you so much for listening and good luck to you as you change course. Thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, I invite you to like share, rate, and subscribe because it helps others find us. 
Change Course is brought to you by Chart House Advisory Services and ConnectedChange.com. Our music is Levity by Emily Clausen. Show notes have moved. We're now at ConnectedChange.com. So visit us there under the Change Course podcast page, and you'll find a list of all the resources that I've mentioned here today. While you're visiting us, sign up for the Change Navigator newsletter. You'll keep on top of all things change. And every month we are sharing exclusive content and resources only with our subscribers. So don't miss out. Sign up at ConnectedChange.com. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's never too late to change course.